the circumcision. We worship God in spirit. Not in the flesh. To be bringing sounds from heaven. And yet we are bringing those sounds in the gyration of demonic spirits. And so, sweet Holy Spirit, we thank you for tonight. Of a truth, Holy Ghost, you will not call a meeting and you yourself will be absent. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your hand that is already stretched forth over this meeting. Do that which only you can do, Holy Ghost. Touch us in places only you can reach. And by the time we are done, sweet Spirit of God, let Jesus be glorified. And let the Father be highly exalted. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' awesome name, we have prayed. You may be seated. Hallelujah. I should have been here earlier, but I'm just coming from the mission field in the north. Yes. So, uh, my flight was delayed, uh, but we thank God that uh, God has granted us safety. Praise God. So, I bring you greetings from the brethren in Bauchi State. <laughs> Hallelujah. And just in case the brethren from Bauchi State are following, Thank you so much for a great meeting. God showed us great mercy, salvations, healings, and miracles. And I trust that the Lord will do great things tonight. In the name of Jesus. We have run out of time, so we'll go straight into the teaching. So we we'll see how Jesus helps us. Revelations, or Revelation, sorry, chapter 3. from verse 7. Revelation chapter 3 from verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. So if you've been here since we started this teaching, by now you should recognize that these letters to the churches were not letters that Paul, I mean John, originated himself. John was just the bearer of the details that Jesus himself wanted to communicate to his church. So John is not the authors of these letters. That is why we call them the letters of Jesus. John was just a messenger. His responsibility was to communicate in accurate details the very things that were burning on the heart of the chief shepherd himself, the owner of the church. So certain things had gone wrong and Jesus wanted to reach out to the churches in the Gentile world. Remember, that these seven churches were not Jewish churches. These seven churches were Gentile churches. So Jesus wanted to communicate his heart to the Gentile church. And he found the Apostle John a credible witness to whom he could commit such truths. Knowing that they would get to those who were his target audience. So first thing is these are the letters of Jesus. So it is the heart 
of Jesus revealed to his church. Now, if you are a student of the Bible, if you have been stirred by the things that you have been taught so far, you would have gone to do some personal Bible study. And if you do personal Bible study and look at the six letters we have looked at so far, and even if you add this seventh letter, you will find out that Jesus was weaving an intricate pattern with the letters. The letters were not haphazard. The letters are not an afterthought. The letters were not accidental. In fact, in beginning with Ephesus and ending with Laodicea, it was intentional. Because you see, since he was writing those letters to the seven churches, he could have begun with Laodicea. He could have begun with Thyatira. He could have begun with Smyrna. Why did he begin with Ephesus? Because he was drawing a spiritual map to describe the journey of a pilgrim on the face of the earth. Such that if you look at the uh, state of each of these churches that Jesus was trying to address, you will find that in the state of these churches was a directive to the consequence of what will happen if you do not take your Christian life seriously. So in Ephesus, you have the loveless church, the church that fell out of deliberate and committed and passionate love for Jesus. In Smyrna, you have the persecuted church, the church that God directed them that Look, I know that you are suffering persecution, but you should be faithful, faithful to the Lord, even unto death. So despite your persecutions, the way you will bring glory to my name is that you will die for what you believe in. So death for those in Smyrna was not a bad thing, so to speak. Dying for their faith was proof of their commitment to the one whom they love. So in Smyrna, you had the persecuted church. After Smyrna, you had the compromised church in Pergamos. After the compromised church in Pergamos, you had the uh, corrupted church in Thyatira. After the corrupted church in Thyatira, you now had the dead church in Sardis. After the dead church in Sardis, you now had the faithful church in Philadelphia. And the last of all of these churches is now the lukewarm church in Laodicea. And that's what we looked at last week. Are you still with me? If you are with me, say amen. amen. Now, if you look at it carefully and you begin with the loveless church, skipping Smyrna and skipping Philadelphia because intentionally, these are the only two churches that Jesus did not condemn. Smyrna and Philadelphia are the only two churches that Jesus did not find something wrong within their ranks that required judgment. So skip Smyrna, skip Philadelphia, and then look at the progression. When you fall out of love for God, the next thing that will naturally happen to you in your Christian pilgrimage is compromise. When you become a creature of compromise, Corruption will naturally flow in the direction of your pilgrimage. Once you have suffered corruption, you will die spiritually. So you become a dead church. And once you are a dead church, or invariably your expression in time will be lukewarm. Such that you are neither here nor there. And God cannot use you. Satan does not appreciate you. You are even useless to your own destiny. So it's a progression. So this is why Jesus gives us insight. He says that if you love me, the proof of your love is not in profession. The proof of your love is in your daily practice. If you lose that burning love for Jesus, once your first love dies and all other kinds of things begin to take attention of your life, 
it's only a matter of time you will be like the church in, in, uh, in uh, Pergamos. You will begin to live a life of compromise. You will begin to make excuses for deviations that God has cursed. You will begin to attract to yourself all kinds of things. Remember that what happened in the church of Pergamos was basically that they had, they began to compromise with the world. How was this compromise happening? Idolatry, sexual immorality. They began to compromise with the world. The difference between the compromise of Pergamos and the corruption of Thyatira is that with Pergamos, the world was outside. So the church was going to the world and trying to fraternize with the world. But in Tiatira, the church opened up her doors and brought the corruption into the church. So they gave a stool to that prophetess, Jezebel, who was now teaching men to live a life of corruption and immorality. So when Jesus was writing these letters, he was intentional. He, was not, he didn't just pick Ephesus by random. It was not a random progression. It was an intricate story. So he began with Ephesus first, indicating that the priority of the believer is absolute love for God. Absolute love for God. Now, if you've listened to my teachings long enough, you should know this now, that by design, mortal man does not have the capacity to love two things or two persons at the same time. So the Bible says to us that if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus says critical and dangerous things like, if any man will be my disciple, he must hate father, hate mother, hate his brothers, hate his sisters, hate his wife, hate his children, and even his own life. So it does, it, there's no capacity for you as a mortal to love your own life and love Jesus. So the Bible says things, basic things like, if any man loves his life in this world, what will happen to him? He will lose it. He will lose it. So by design, as you were factored on the bench wheel of eternity, God designed you intentionally that when it comes to the matters of affection, the matters of love, the matters of attention, the matters of priority, there is only one that can capture the heart and the soul of the mother. You cannot be divided. It is out of your 100% love for God that you can love somebody else. So your love for your wife should come out of your love for God. Your love for your siblings should come out of your love for God. If it does not come out of that love, then whatever love you are trying to express will be fake. So Jesus was showing us a pattern, a pattern. If you find somebody who has become a victim of compromise, I will show you somebody whose affection has been stolen by an idol. Once your affection has been stolen by an idol, you will naturally tow the pathways of compromise. And Jesus was by that letter showing us that the end of every man or the spiritual condition of every man is never an accident. Your Christian life is predictable. That's what he was showing us. It's predictable. If you love God honestly and you pursue God carelessly and with all determination and honesty, we can predict what you will become in God in the matter of time. And if you deviate from loving God with all your heart and begin to chase after idols, we can also predict what you will become in the matter of time. So what I'm saying to you is, what you look like now, this is November. In 50, 55 days, this 2023 will be gone. The quality and the depth of your Christian life at this moment is not an accident. The way you are with your prayer life, the way you are with your Bible study life, your commitment to God, is not Satan that brought you there. What you are looking like in the spirit now, your appetites for the things of God that have died, 
It's not Satan's fault. It's not the fault of a demon. Your deliberate choices have determined your end. So if you are going to change how you end, if you don't want to end up like Laodicea, mm, where you are neither hot nor cold, and like I said to you, what that means is if you are hot, mm, you are useful to God. If you are cold, you are useful to Satan. If you are lukewarm, you are neither useful to God, neither useful to Satan, and even useless to yourself. Because what is the use of a man that is on the face of the earth? God cannot use him. Satan cannot even use him. Who will use you now? So his end is already crafted out for him by his choices. So somebody might be asking, then what of Smyrna and Philadelphia? Whenever the church faces persecution, the demand from heaven is what? Faithfulness. Are you with me? So the revelation of the persecution that Smena was going through is mirrored in the faithfulness of Philadelphia. So when we read for that, you will see that God says to them, and by God I mean Jesus, he says to them that even though you have little strength, they were not a big church. They were not a powerful people. They had small strength. In fact, the word that is used to describe them as people of little strength, if you translate it literally in the Greek, it means a weak people. This is why in the body of Christ, we do not call ourselves strong men. The, the phrase, a strong man for Jesus, is just a metaphor for a weak man that has been helped by Jesus. So we are not strong in the sense that we have strength in ourselves. We are strong in the sense that we are helped, we are aided. So if you ever find a man that looks strong in the physical because of his work with God, I show you a weak man broken on that rock that is Jesus. He's helped. And one of the major things that God wants to help you to do is to survive the persecution, the compromise, the contradictions that exist in this world. And that's my emphasis tonight. I want to put a seal on this teaching. And the prayer burden I have carried since last night is I will finish. You see me, me, I want to finish. And it's not just to finish, I want to finish properly. What I hope to do is after we read about Philadelphia, I've already tried to deal with what was in Philadelphia. I've already told you that this is one out of the two churches that God did not find anything to judge. Remember in all the other letters you'll see, I know thy works. Do you remember? That thou art this, thou art this, thou art this, but you have become this, you have become that, you have become that, and as a consequence of that, if you do not repent, I will come and take away your lampstand. You will not find that in Philadelphia. You will not find that. In fact, see the way Jesus introduces himself. himself verse 9. See the way he introduces himself. Huh? Where are we? Go to verse 8. It's verse 7 I read now. So we should be in verse 8. I know thy works. See, I have set before you an open door no, go back to seven. That's not what I'm looking for. Aha. This thing says he, who is what? Holy. Who is what? Holy. Who is holy? Who is true? Who has the key of David? Who, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Remember I taught you that every time God wants to deal with the anomaly in the church that he identified, he introduces himself as the solution. He comes with a posture to address the deviation he has seen in the church. You remember that? So here, there is no deviation in Philadelphia. But Jesus introduces himself the way he introduces himself throughout the entire Bible. I've taught you before, and I hope that you have taken the challenge. Go and study scriptures. You will not find anywhere where God is introducing himself, God is introducing himself. I'm not saying somebody is introducing God. 
I'm not saying somebody is describing God. God is introducing himself or describing himself where he describes himself as a God of love. It's not in the Bible. But there are two basic ways you will always hear God talking about himself. I am holy. I am righteous. Two critical words. So he says here, this thing says he who is what? And he who is what? True. Even though true here doesn't mean righteous, true here doesn't mean a God of justice, but true here encapsulates the fact that he's authentic. He's not fake. And once you find one who is authentic, you will find one who is righteous. Once you find one who is authentic, you will find one who is just. Are you with me? So he says, he who is holy. It was because, obviously, that the Philadelphians or the church in Philadelphia had a correct, correct revelation of who God is. Somehow that affected their posture. So even if they were not as big as all the other churches, because they had a correct definition of who God is, it precipitated upon their hearts the demands for faithfulness. One of the things affecting the body of Christ right now in our generation is a definition of who God is. So a woman stands up in her church. She's under pressure. Her husband is a pastor, so she must do ministry. And once her husband is a pastor and she must do ministry, the only ministry available for the pastor's wife is marriage ministry. Are you with me? So she now has to do marriage ministry. So she's under pressure to do marriage ministry. So she climbs the pulpit in a youth meeting or in her church meeting and begins to tell young people who natural hair help. See, as a Christian, the way to get husband is wear your, 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 your human hair, then do it like this, do it like this. <laughs> I say I will not talk about this thing. I don't know how. I don't know how I got there. I say I will not. I say they will not hear anything from my mouth, but I could not resist it. Have, be praying for me. Be praying for me. I say you, 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 say, you are saying you want to be like Catherine Kuma. You want to be like Catherine. No man will marry you. Go out on Friday. Go out. They say if they call you, are you available? Say I'm available. Hey. I say Jesus. A generation is desperately trying to redefine who God is. That is why faithful men are lacking. Your faithfulness is heavily dependent on the revelation of God. If you don't know that God is holy, you see, people are not going to just escape into heaven. You are not going to be able to deceive God. A demand in this realm is that if your God is holy, you too must be holy. You must be separate. You must be distinct. That's why we don't need to dress up on Friday night to find a husband. In this, in this kingdom, God still speaks to people about marriage. I remember I heard the testimony of a 40-year-old girl, woman, 40-year-old. She was in her house, her house in Abuja, her house, and there was a knock on her door. She opened the door, a man was standing there. Good-looking man. Are you so-and-so? Yes. Sorry, oh, I was praying. And God gave me your name. All the way from Lagos. Never met her before. But she was a faithful sister. Now you, you, you hear that kind of testimony. My generation. In our minds we cannot picture that kind of thing happening. Because we don't have a correct description about God. The Bible says he is the one that settles the solitary in families. It's in the scripture. He takes the single, the lonely, and he plants them in families. So even your marriage 
under God is supposed to be divinely orchestrated. He's supposed to plant you. But you went and found one for yourself in the night on Friday. And then you are wondering why your marriage is now redoed by all kinds of things. If you know what is happening in the world, you will take God seriously. If you know the adultery, men now that are not born again can't sleep well in the night. Everybody, there's a big ball board at PTI Junction. Is advertising DNA test. Now me be the papa. Levo zila marco. The boy, big board is big. Because there's a crisis now in the world. Men don't know whether or them be the world. Papa. Can't sleep in the night. Imagine being in such a marriage. And every day you are looking at your wife. You are not sure. You see me? I can travel for 52 months. I'm not shaking. The way I left my angel is the way I will meet her. Mm. There's no... And the way I went is the way I will come to. <laughs> there's, no cause, there's no cause for alarm. No cause for alarm. All the children I have, now me be the papa, now me. Now me be the papa. If you know, there's a thread on Twitter. And it, all the brother is doing, he's collating the escapades of married couples with infidelity. The last time I checked, it was at number 27. Married young boys are coming to tell stories of how they are sleeping with married women. You don't know what is happening in the world. Married men are coming to share stories of how they are, they are conning their wives and sleeping with single girls. And they think that that is the proof of their masculinity. And you see, by the time you probe these people carefully, they all come from a place that looks like a church. The reason faithfulness is lost on a generation, our definition, our revelation of who God is, is corrupted. God is holy. God is true. God is sovereign sovereign he has the key of David what he opens is open what he shuts he shuts you see help me Holy Ghost there is, I've taught you many times there is nothing God cannot give you but you can't pressure God to give you something when he does not want to give it and what God gives you is not necessarily the proof it's not a validation of your debt with God because he allows the rain to fall both on the righteous and the sinner. He does not, when the sun wants to shine, he does not say it will not shine in that witchcraft person's house. He shines there. Sometimes it will even shine brighter. And don't be angry with me, I'm just quoting scriptures. The Bible says that the loving kindness of God, the long suffering of God, is so that the sinner will come to what? So mercy is both for the believer and the sinner. The sinner enjoys a dimension of mercy just as the believer enjoys a dimension of mercy. We enjoy his mercy as sons and daughters. They enjoy his mercy in the hope that they will come to the knowledge of Jesus. They will come to the knowledge of Jesus. Second thing I need to put in your spirit tonight is what is your revelation of God? Who do you think God is? If you are going to have the kind of testimony the Philadelphian church had, and remember, this church is not a building, it's a group of people. Are you with me? So from the angel of the church in Philadelphia to the person who is the protocol person outside, all of them were faithful men and women. Kai. Do you know, I, I, when I sat in the lounge waiting for my flight, I kept brood, brooding on this. You mean an entire church? Hmm? An entire church. 
from pastor to the so-called least person in the church, God looked carefully. And you know when the eyes of God is looking at something, he doesn't miss anything. He, his eyes are piercing light. He looked at an entire church. He could not find one strand of unfaithfulness. One strand. What kind of church? What, what, what were they teaching them in that church? What kind of things were they hearing? Not one. Not one youth that said, my body, they do me somehow. and went to fornicate. Not one. Not one. And there must have been young people there. Not one married man that is cutting eye for his sister in church. Not one. Hmm. And you see, I've taught you many times, if your revelation of who God is is not correct, you can't survive persecution. No. You will balk under pressure. You will deny Jesus. Pump and pray. And you see, don't believe me. Oh. Just pray that the kind of persecution going on in the north does not reach here. Just pray. I was looking at the Christians in Bauchi and I was saying, wow. You know when I got the invitation, I thought it was one small place in, inside Bauchi. When I walked into the church, it was massive. And I said, in Bauchi. And I saw Christians praying and crying out for God. They are not looking for a breakthrough. They want Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Living their lives. A civil servant state. And this is why when you go to the north, you can touch authentic Christianity. Authentic Christianity. Because some of them are going to church knowing that anything can happen is on Sunday service. The building can be burnt down. Their village can be overrun by headsmen. They can die any moment. So their faithfulness is something they leave out in practice. Oh my God, there's no time tonight. Their faithfulness. So Jesus commended this church. Let's go further now. Let's read verse 8. I know your works. See, I have said before you an open door and no one can shut it for you. Have a what? Have kept my word and have not what? Despite the fact that they had what? So when you hear somebody say, it's my weakness, it's my weakness for 15 years. There's something wrong. You have a little strength, but with your little strength, you have what? Kept my word. Your obedience is the proof of your love. And have not denied my name. Verse 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have what? So it was a Gentile church. So there were certain Jews who went to form their own so-called church and they called it the synagogue of Satan. They were claiming to be Jews, but they are not really Jews. And they had made themselves an opposition to this small church and probably was mocking the way they were living. But Jesus was saying to them, to the Philadelphian church, that don't worry. They seem to be mocking you now and it looks as if they have something special. But when a time is going to come, it will now become obvious that it is you that I what? Have loved. You see, be encouraged, dear sister. Right now, it looks as if you are foolish. You, are, you don't have sense. You don't have open eye. You are not wise. Everybody is sleeping around. Sex now is like, it's like puff puff. It's free. It's very cheap. Everywhere. And you, you are keeping yourself. And it looks as if you are the one that does not have sense. God says, I will make them come and worship before your feet. The whole idea is to let them know that it is you that I have loved. No time. Next verse. I want to tie this up today. Because you have kept my commandment to persevere, 
I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. What is he talking about here? The tribulation. Now, pre-tribulation teachers have used this scripture to say, Jesus said he will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. However, that phrase, keep you from, is used only two times in the entire Bible. Two times. Two times. The second time, I think is John 17 now, when Jesus says, they are in the world. Hmm? But I'm not asking you to remove them from the world. But I'm asking that you keep them out of the hand of the evil one. Which scripture is that? 1715, Ba. 17 what? Let's find it. John 17, uh, 15. Yes, 17, 15. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. That is the same word that is used, the Greek that is used in Revelation. So, if we compare the usage, he says, I'm not saying take them out of the world. Are you with me? I'm saying that while they are in the world, preserve them from what? So when he says, I will keep you from the tri hour of trial that will come to test the whole world, he's using the same metaphor that he used in Matthew 24 when he spoke about the days of Noah. Noah was preserved, but where was he? In the flood. Are you with me? So if you want to use that scripture to establish the fact that the church would have been taken, then you must be able to explain using the same phrase that Jesus uses here. Because that is what he is trying to say in Revelations. Now somebody will say, okay, let's look at it in context. Look at it in context. He now goes further in Revelations to say, behold, I come quickly. If he is talking about taking you away before he comes, eh? he will not tell you, hold fast what you have. I come quickly. So that no one may what? That's what the Bible is teaching. This is what I actually want to talk about tonight. But <laughs> I want to talk about your crown. Your crown. So if you have the time when you get home, go and check. You will now see that at the end of every chapter, not every chapter, at the end of every discourse, letter, that's the right word, to the churches, Jesus gives a promise of what? A reward. So let's go quickly now. Media, help me. Let's go very quickly. Give me Revelations 2. 2. Revelation 2. I don't know why I keep calling it Revelations. Revelation 2, verse 6. Or is it verse 5 now? Help me, Holy Spirit. Revelation 2, verse 6. Help me, media. Revelation 2, verse 6. We're out of time. 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who what? I want you to repeat that word. Say it one more time. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the first thing the overcomer gets is what? Access to the tree of life. Notice that the metaphor God uses here is the paradise of God. Speaking in the same language of Eden. Are you with me? So we are going to go back. The new earth, the new heavens, and the rule of God is being, being described as the same paradise that Eden was at the beginning. So where Adam went and chose the tree of good and evil and created a lineage of called the children of disobedience, everyone that overcomes will now have access to eat of the tree of life. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Next thing. 
Revelation 2, 11. Okay, 11, 11. 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who what? Shall not be what? Hurt by the second death. Remember the first death is termination or cessation of life. Physical death. Where everybody will go to. The people who die before the coming of Jesus Christ will go to the grave. But everyone that overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. What is the second death? Where those who rebel against God are cast into where? Lake of fire. So what is the second gift for the overcomer? He will not suffer the second day. Uh, I think the next one should be 29. 17. Okay. 17. 17. These people in media, they need anointing. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who what? I will give some of the hidden manna to eat and I will give him a white stone. On the stone a name written which no one knows except him who what? I don't have the time. But you see, I tried to study this verse because this verse has troubled me. And many Bible scholars are of the opinion that this white stone is like an invitation card. And that invitation card is to the marriage banquet of the Lamb. So only those who overcome will receive this ivy. And on that ivy is like a, a loving father or a lover giving a special invitation to the one whom he loves, to a special banquet. So the one that overcomes will get an ivy, a stone, with a name on it. Only you and the father know the name that is written on it. So it means the name will not be Kesena. Are you with me? So I'm wondering what Jesus is going to call me. Ole Vunama. You know there are some people that their wives call them the biggest cockroach in my lab. And there are people who hate cockroach. My wife can't stand cockroach. But when they call him my biggest cockroach in my lab, he does like this. The name is sweet. It's not about what the name is. It's about who is calling it. I wonder what he will call me. What is he going to write on that stone that he will put in my hand? I wonder. But what I know is that it's going to flow from a heart of love. 3 verse 5. 3 verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in what? Laba laba usha. And I will not what? But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Invariably, dear brother and sister, it means that he that does not overcome. Hmm. Stay with me tonight. He that overcomes, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. So what will happen to him that does not overcome? Eh? Is English now. His name will be what? So you see, what I'm trying to show you tonight, I don't have time. Go and read the end of all the other letters. Eh? What I'm trying to show you tonight is that heaven is for overcomers. <laughs> and like a preacher said many years ago, for you to be called an overcomer, there must be things that you have come over. There must be things you have come over. Heaven, the Christian identity of warrior ends in the earth. The Christian identity of slave ends in the earth. The Christian identity of builder ends in the earth. Priest ends in the earth. 
There are only three critical identities that will take us to the other side. Son. Is it three now or two? Son. And then will be part of God's ruling council. As kings and judges. I know one sweet thing I discovered in reading Revelation is that, the letters of Jesus is that, the promise for the overcomer at the end of the first letter, I, there's no time, and the promise for the overcomer at the end of the last letter. You see, these letters of Jesus were very deep. Oh. The promise for the overcomer at the end of the first letter and the one at the end of the last letter is the promise of the entire book of Revelation. At the end of the first letter, you have the tree of life. At the end of the last letter, he says, we will sit with him on thrones. This is the ultimate promise for the Christian in the entire book of Revelation. And you don't need to believe me. Go and do Bible study. I was listening to my father in the Lord today, and he was saying that we, do, we should not be finishing sermons anymore now. He said, because the church is too lazy. So let's be preaching half half things. So you say 12 points to your greatness. I'll teach only two. <laughs> only two. You go and study the rest. When you sweat and sweat. So you go and study. Go and study Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 22. And you will see that what I say is not a lie. The ultimate reward once the new heaven and the new earth comes is that those of us that are overcomers will have access to the tree of life. And I wanted to talk to you about crowns, but there's no time. That is what the Bible calls the crown of life. Because in the Bible, there are five crowns that are accrued to the one that is called an overcomer. And that's where I want to end this teaching. 1 Corinthians 9.25, we'll tie it up there. There is the incorruptible crown. There is the crown of righteousness. There is the crown of rejoicing, which is also called the soul winner's crown. There is the crown of life, which is just a metaphor for eternal life. So man will no longer die. He will live forever with God. The very quality of the life of God will now be imputed to him. That's the crown of life. And then what's the fifth one now? Huh? Crown of glory. Bless you, man of God. Crown of glory. And you know, we grew up in church. Hmm. I even used it to preach this weekend. Huh? We grew up in church saying that when you get to heaven, when you win souls, there will be many stars on your crown. It's not in the Bible. Are you aware it's not in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. There's no place in the Bible where the Bible says that when you get to heaven, there will be stars. One star for every soul that you, soul that you want. Some of you have become covetous of stars. You've been thinking of how you'll be posing with your stars. It's not in the Bible. And I did a careful study of the crowns and I found out I do not believe that this thing will be a physical crown. Because how are you going to wear five crowns on your head? How are you going to wear it? The crown of glory, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of life, the crown of righteousness and an incorruptible crown. Now I went to look carefully at the words that are translated crown when it relates to the rewards that a Christian will get. And I found out that in the, in the Greek, there are two words for crown. There is one that speaks of a crown that kings wear. It's called a royal diadem. It's the crown for kings. That's not what is used. So when he says crown of life, it does not use that Greek word. When he says crown of glory, he does not use that Greek word. He uses the Greek word called Stephanos. And you know what Stephanos is? Is the victor's crown. And the victor's crown 
that Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 9 is not a crown that is valuable because of the the material, God bless you, the material by which it is made. It's a crown that is valuable because of what it represents. Are you with me? So when an athlete gets to the finish line and finishes the race, they put a crown, a prize to honor that athlete. And this crown that signified that the athlete was a winner eh, was just a crown of, 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 of figs, leaves, plant. But the athlete wore it with pride. As he's walking, people are honoring him. Behold the champion. His shoulder is raised high. Because it's not, you know you, you want to go to heaven because you think you'll be walking on the streets of gold with golden crown. Eh? It's not the material by which the crown is made. It is a seal upon you validating the things you had to conquer. To come and spend eternity with Jesus. So that word that is called overcomer actually also means in the Greek conqueror. So heaven is not going to be a place for all commas. Hmm? Heaven is for conquerors. Men, like Paul is talking about here, he says, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown, 26. Therefore, I run toss. Christianity is a race. Not with uncertainty, toss I fight. Christianity is a fight. Not as one who beats the air. But I do what? One who will be qualified to stand in the realms of God and receive a reward at the judgment seat of, of Christ must be one that has conquered self. If you can't conquer self, you, there, is no, there is no crown for you. No crown. In fact, self is so powerful that self can prevent you from even making it into the new Jerusalem. Self. Self is one of the enemies a man must conquer. I know when yourself is alive. You love yourself more than God. Look at it now. 55 days or 56 days to end the year. Check your life. Who has benefited the most from your financial blessings? Self or Jesus? Who has benefited the most from your time? Self or Jesus? Who has benefited the most from your body? Self or the cross? I've taught you before, the only solution to self is death. That's how you overcome self. That's how you conquer the flesh. You take the flesh and you go and put it on the cross. If you will follow me, you must take up your cross. <laughs> you see, as I was reading this scripture, I was almost in tears in the car from Bauchi. Because it became obvious to me huh, that we all, there are two things here. Some people won't make it to. Hmm. And don't be angry with the preacher. Eh? I just showed you in the Bible. It's him that overcomes that his name will not be blotted. So if you don't conquer self, if you don't conquer the world, you don't conquer Satan. It means the name will be what? It's not me. Don't be afraid. It's Jesus. Be blotted. 
If it's not possible for the name to be blotted, Jesus will not have said his name will not be blotted. We're blotted. So there are some people that will not make it. But there's another set of people. Eh? They will make it. We will all be in heaven. But our difference from one another will be eternal. We will not be the same. Some will be shining in the brightness of glory. The kind of glory that Moses cried for. He said, show me your glory. You know there are some people, they are fornicating now, committing adultery now, stealing company money, carrying company diesel in the night. Huh? Company laptop is in your house and you have even put a sticker on the top. The Lord Jehovah Jireh. You are a thief. It's in your house. Any small girl that comes around you, you are looking for how to, to touch her body. Immorality is like a god. Eh? You know what they are hoping? That when they want to die, they are preparing. Yeah? They are trying to scam God. Yahoo, yahoo. They are preparing. Say, as I go, just won't die. I will say, Jesus, I'm sorry. The truth is that it will work for some people. Some people be what they say, gee, the bullet done. <laughs> huh? But some they will shake, shake, shake. Then they will be seeing their life. You see, uh, there is no greater philosopher than the man that is near the gate of death. Hmm? His life will just be passing, he will not realize. It's true these things these preachers were saying. This life is a waste. Then he will cry. Save me! And Jesus will have been waiting for you. And we save him. But when he gets to eternity, he will now find out that we are not the same. <laughs> you will get there and find out that there are crowns. We will all be in heaven, but we will be eternally different. Every time you look at your brother, you remember that I wasted in the earth. We will not look the same. We will not have the same place. I, I didn't have time to show you. He says, when you overcome, he will give you a seat with him to judge the nations. So some of us, are going to sit over nations. Somebody will say we are too many. There are enough nations. Then that one that escaped into heaven, he will say, you will come to the father. Like Esau came to Isaac. Bless me also. You say, no, no, no. This, this, this team is for overcomers. This, this throne is for conquerors. What did you conquer? Nothing. If some people are not planning to escape to heaven, some people are thinking that they are going to deceive God with their lukewarmness. They will be nominal Christians, faking their Christianity and going on every day. And just think that we will come to heaven and all of us will be the same. You lie. It's not in the Bible. Did you not read that every man's work will be tried? And when it is put to the fire, you are going to check the quality of the work. I was listening to Apostle Gideon Odoma. He says that the Bible did not say of what size it is. That it will be tried of what sort. Sort it is. It's a quality test. Some people are born this word of God and this Christianity with their whole lives. Then you want to come in there after joking with Jesus in the earth. You think Christianity is a joke? Paul said, I run. 
not without purpose i am definite the finish line is in the sight of my gaze i keep seeing the finish line brother i want to finish sometimes i'll finish ministry and they need protocol to guide me like this because people are coming they just want to touch the preacher then i'll get to my room and beg god you will see what paul said here he said but i discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when i have preached to others i myself should become what <laughs> i want to finish i want to finish you may laugh at us now and look at us like foolish people now but when we die there's a crown of glory it's a garment of beauty we do not yet know what we shall be but what we know is that when he comes many will make it to that side and they will find out that they didn't qualify for the crown of life They didn't qualify. So the letters of Jesus were a metaphor. Jesus was trying to tell us that the Christian life is a fight. You must have things that you come over. You can't conquer yourself at this time when souls are perishing. Satan can still wake you up in the night to masturbate. Oh God! Oh God! Time they go. Time they go. At this time, you see me, somebody will be telling you, they don't watch those kind of movies. We don't see those. Oh, what is wrong with my generation? I keep begging God, don't let persecution come to the Nigerian church. We can't survive. We're not ready. We're not ready. Hunger. Hunger will make some people deny Jesus. You don't need to believe me. Hunger. You can't even curb your sexual appetite. You want, you will now come and say, give us the land. And Satan is looking. Who is, who is this? What do you think say this thing be? What do you think say be? The demons you are trying to fight in the spirit, if you know they are consecration. If you know their commitment to Satan, you will know that you should not joke in that arena. The sons of Skiva went there to joke, they came back naked. Naked. Heaven is for overcomers. If Satan still has something that he can flash before your face like this, and you are ready to buy, you are in trouble. Because the world and all its lusts, the Bible says, is passing away. From the pages of my heart, let my worship begin and never end to the God of all flesh. From the pages of my heart, let my worship begin but never end to the God of all flesh. From the pages of From my heart, pages of my heart, let my worship, let my worship begin but never end to the God. To the God of all Pages of my heart. Pages of my heart. Let my worship begin, but never end. To the God of all things, He's my God. He's my God, and His name is Yahweh. His name is Yahweh. Yahweh.
Jesus. Your name. I serve Jesus. I don't serve mammon. the world tonight I do not serve my flesh I do not serve mammon I do not serve the world I have only one God he is my God and his name is Yahweh I don't live for Cassiana I don't live for the world I don't live for money there's something more to my life I'm an overcomer I will run my race. I will fight my battles. I will win my wars. For I will make it to the end. I will finish. Can you pray? Can you pray? Sex will not stop me halfway. Persecution will not stop me halfway. Love for the world will not stop me halfway. I will finish. Oh my God, I thought you would pray. Grace is being released in this house tonight. Philadelphia, they had little strength. He said, but despite your little strength, you have kept my word. You have kept my word. You have honored my name. Despite your little strength, you have kept your fire, your prayer altar burning. Despite your little strength, you have committed to the study of the word. Despite your little strength, you have refused to defile yourself with fornication. Despite your little strength, you have refused to steal company money despite your little strength he said because you have kept yourself i will also keep you from the hour of trouble that will come upon the whole earth if i were you i will prophesy to myself i will finish He that puts his hand upon the plow and look at back is not worthy to be the disciple of Jesus. I will fight my flesh. I will fight the world. I will fight the devil. Satan, the blood is against you. I serve Jesus. I serve Jesus. I don't serve my flesh. I serve Jesus. He's my God. Call the name of your God tonight. My God is not money. My God is not fame. My God is not popularity. My God is not wealth. My God is not food. My God is not sex. He's my God.
give a strength to the weak. He give a strength to the weak. He give a strength to the weak. And to them that he faint, he increases might. I see some of you crying. Don't be ashamed of your tears. Don't be ashamed of your tears. I don't serve Yahoo. I'm not a fraudster. I'm not a prostitute. He's my God. My God, there's no time. I see the Lord wearing people grace like a garment. I see it in the spirit. He's wearing it upon people like a garment. Grace! I don't know the young lady in the middle here. You are a survivor. You will survive. That's what the Lord says I should tell you. You will survive. Satan can cripple your life. Satan can cripple your destiny. Satan can write your story. There is a God in heaven. Jesus. Jesus. Throughout this week, when you come out of your house, say, I serve Jesus. I don't serve immorality. Huh? I don't serve mama. I'm not living to please myself. This flesh has been taken to the cross. A young man needs to wake up tonight and say, I don't serve sleep. I don't serve sleep. You demon of sleep that has crippled my prayer life. I break out of your yoke. Oh my God, there's vision tonight. If not, I feel like going a little further. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Daddy, put your hand on this life. Hear the cries of our heart. Hear the cries of our heart. Put your hand on this life. Let a new journey begin. Make this one an overcomer. Make this one a conqueror. Wherever you are on the top of your voice, shout Jesus. For the second time, let the devil know that we do not bow to him. Shout Jesus. For the last time, Shout it from your belly. Some of you will feel the fire coming upon you. Shout Jesus. That's the power of God. Thank you, Lord. 
Oh my God, we need to close. You see, I love Jesus. And I'm determined. I was telling the Lord in the car, I will carry my wife. I will carry my children. I give you a vow, we will finish. No matter the hurdles Satan puts on our way, we will finish. The family of Kesena is city, we will finish. Even our CN worry, everyone that is here tonight, I prophesy to you, you will finish. Those of you online also, as everybody says amen here, yeah, it affects you. You will finish! <laughs>